Well, we're, uh, we're going to take this month with one story in the Gospels to get really personal. Uh, we're going to get personal with Jesus. We're going to get personal with each other because of Jesus. And to do that, we're going to use this story of Zacchaeus. Uh, this story starts with, Z- with Jesus calling Zacchaeus down from this tree by his name. And it ends with Zacchaeus finding salvation. And it's not just salvation. Again, you, you might get weary of me saying this regularly, but I, there might be nothing more important that I say about salvation regularly than that when we talk salvation in the, in the Jesus sense of salvation, we're not just talking about a ticket punch to eternity. All right, I got my card. I'm, no matter what happens, I'm not going to the hot place. We're not, we're not just talking about that. We are talking about transformation, saving of the life right now, that there is this this, uh, infinite value that that God has for our lives and the lives of the people in this world around us uh, for this very day. So for Zacchaeus, the transformation we're going to read about, uh, and and today's focus won't be as much on that. We're going to get to that in next week's. We're going to talk about how to get to that transformation first, though. But for Zacchaeus, it's very tangible. It's, it's a very much a starting today, my life is different kind of thing. And that has ripple effects. It has ramifications that are very real for the people around him. So uh, today is focusing on this notion of name, though. My name and your name and, and the, the meaningfulness that there is in us knowing each other's names, even knowing about our names uh, a young mother was on a couch watching TV, and she had a little baby grown inside of her, and that baby made its first kick during a Life Serial commercial, and so she decided that she would name a one-day pastor Mikey after that, that famous 1970s commercial campaign where the kids don't want to try the healthy new cereal, and they say, give it to Mikey. He won't eat anything. So like, if he likes it, we know it's decent. It's passable. And, uh, and just like the life cereal, Mikey, I also grew up to be a very picky eater, and I don't eat a whole lot, but I do like life cereal. Uh, so I share that to say, to ask really, do you know anything about the roots of your name, whether it's your first name or your middle name or even your last name, anything about your, your lineage or heritage that plays into uh, that name? You, I, I'm guessing that there are some meaningful stories behind many of your names out here, and uh, I, I, I grieve the thought that there's somebody sitting right next to you who doesn't know that you were named after a special relative, or they don't know that there was a meaningful location that mom and dad had, and they named you after that place, or perhaps you're named after a dream that your parents held out for you. So I want to do something bold this morning. We're going to pause the sermon And if you're willing, everything is invitation, never coercion uh, with me here. But I want to take a minute for you to turn to the person next to you. And if you don't want to do this, just go into a state of prayer like this and they won't bother you. (laughs) But a lot of you are sitting by friends. And if you're not sitting by somebody, you can make a quick friend and just say, hey, I know this about my name, dot, dot, dot. Or maybe you say, you know what? My rotten parents never told me anything about why I was named you know, Agatha or whatever it would be. So let's, let's take a minute, share with somebody something that you might know about your name and hear something interesting that somebody may have to share. I'll time you.
ba bum 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 bum. All right. Well, I've opened Pandora's box of name sharing. I'm thrilled. I was, I was partly worried that the talking would die down after 15 seconds and you wouldn't participate. If, if, I, if I cut you off mid-story, I'm very sorry about that. Make sure to maybe do this. Write a note to your neighbor telling them the rest of it. And, or, or you could tell them verbally after we get done with worship. When we know somebody's name, when we know something even about their name, when we know their name well enough to pronounce it in a way that has a particular familiarity to it, how we say their name, what we know about it, all of these things can, uh, they can really convey a level of personal intimacy way beyond simply going, hey pal, hey friend which is what I do for large groups, hey friends, but boy, what a difference it makes if we're face to face and you know my name and I know yours. It reflects honor, dignity, and care. We can communicate so much to somebody when we simply know their name, when we use their name. We say to them, I notice that you're here. And conversely, if I notice when you're here, whether it would be in church or some other space, I also notice when you are not here. It conveys that I know something about you. It conveys, even maybe depending on how I say the name. Now, if your name is Newman, and I say it like Jerry used to say to his mailman, hello, Newman, then I'm conveying, I'm not glad that you're around, but if, but if your name is Kramer, and I say, hey, the K-man, what's up? Well, then you know I'm, I'm happy to see you. I like being around you. We also can convey that we recognize that there is something deeply worthwhile in you and in each other. So let's keep all of that in, in mind, sort of the, the notion of the, the primacy of name and all that can be conveyed in it as we read for our first time through this Jesus and Zacchaeus story. We're going to read this story uh, four different times over this month, four different ways. Three of those are going to be translations of the Bible and then on the last one, we're going to get really crazy. The last Sunday we use it, and we're going to sing together that old Sunday school song. I know some of you are dying to start singing even right now. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Hold on to that. Uh, we'll get back to that at the end of the month. But here's the, here's the overall story for the first time for those of you that may not be familiar with it. It's found in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10 says that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus, and he was the chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead, and he climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up, and he said to him, Zacchaeus! Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. And all who saw it began to grumble. And they said, he's gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. We ask for God's blessing on this, the reading aloud, the hearing, and most importantly for us, that God would bless our living out of these words of this holy story found in our scriptures. So we're going to get to Zacchaeus. We'll get back to him in a moment. But first, I want to talk about Jesus for a second and talk about the name of Jesus. Uh, thinking just about the musical emphasis that we put on the name of Jesus throughout our, the church's history, the early church, the kind of in, in America revival era, 1800s, late 1800s, 1900s, and uh, even in the modern contemporary movement over the last, say, 50 years, 
we find all kinds of titles and commonly known lyrics of these songs that the work that they are looking to do in the song is to lift up, to, to glorify, to give uh, worthwhileness to and honor the name of Jesus. Our opening song this morning, as Dr. Marcos laid it out, glorify thy name in all the earth. We have uh, all hail the power of Jesus' name. We have blessed be the name of the Lord. We have his name is wonderful. Uh, I love these lines, no other name but the name of Jesus, no other name but the name of the Lord, name above all names, worthy of all praise. There's something the music reflects not just in, this is just a tiny tip of the iceberg sampling of songs and, and lines, but, but so much of Christian music throughout our history has reflected that in order to get personal with the Savior, in part, is to know the Savior by name. His name is wonderful. His name is Jesus. In Hebrew, that, that name is pronounced Yeshua. Or in, in more, you know, um, appropriately transliterated into English, we would really call Jesus Joshua more than we would Jesus. Yeshua. We have that name meaning to save or to deliver. And then we have this other, this title that is attached to the name of Jesus. It's not his last name. He doesn't have a middle initial. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Shame. I'm just kidding. Uh, but the last name is Christ, and not last name, the title is Christ, and in Hebrew, that's Messiah, and it means anointed one. So his name, the name of the Savior that we hold so dear is Yeshua, the one who saves, and he is anointed by God in that saving. I can still recall the early years of being in church uh, when I was a, a young teenager, and I remember having something of a like an awkwardness and a reverence for people who spoke, not necessarily in, you know, if they were doing something as part of church and they had to read the name Jesus Christ, I could understand that. But somebody who would be speaking about their faith personally and reference the name of Jesus. They would reference their love in conversation for Jesus Christ or their following of Jesus Christ. And there was a part of me at that young age, before I had been particularly kind of exposed to the personal nature of God, that I recoiled a bit, and I would think, a little bit more reverence is in order here. I had a grandmother, after all, who said, you call everyone sir or ma'am, or you get the shoe. You get the size six. You don't, ever, you, you don't refer to somebody who is your senior as Bob. Why, that's Mr. Roberts. Or if you get really familiar, Mr. Bob. And, and, and so I would hear people say Jesus Christ in these ways that reflected like a familiarity and would reflect a, an intimacy that as a young person, I thought, boy, well, who do they think they are? Just getting to say Jesus' name uh, by his name. So there, there's an element of that instinct that is kind of part of the, our larger faith narrative and tradition. You know, the, the first self-described self -described name that God gives to the world in our, in our scriptures is when Moses approaches the burning bush. And the burning bush, a voice comes out saying, you're going to free the, the Hebrew slaves that are in Egypt. And Moses is like, this is never going to work. But let's assume that it might work. When I go to the, to the Hebrew slaves and I say, God has sent me to come free you, they're going to ask me, oh yeah, well, which God is that? Because there's a whole lot of them. And I don't know if you talk to the right one. You might be leading us into a trap. And that's when Moses hears back that name that throughout our Jewish ancestors' history, they've referred to simply as the divine name. Uh, what was given to Moses is this name that could be written down and the letters of it could be shared, but, but the name itself was unspeakable. It, it's a series of four kind of breath letters in the Hebrew. Yo, ha, va, ha. And so over time and, and outside of the Jewish tradition, we started putting those together. And, you know, most commonly 
Yahweh, sometimes Jehovah. If you're ever watching the old classic Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade with Sean Connery, Indy at one point has to solve a puzzle. There's all these tiles on the floor and he's got to walk. The tiles have different um, uh, Latin letters on them and he's got to walk in the name of God. And, and, he, and he knows the name is Jehovah. But then to the side, his father, he, under his breath, Sean Connery, but Indy, in the Latin, Jehovah begins with an I. And it's, anyway, I don't do a great Sean Connery. You're playing both sides. You just kind of do something like that. But, uh, but the name, we've tried over the centuries, this divine name of God to put some, some form and some speakability to it in our desire to become more intimate with God. And so here's the great thing about Jesus coming to earth when it comes to name, is that the name Yeshua is a super common name in first century Israel. It's a little bit like being named Mike, maybe, or Bob, or, or, or whatever you, you might think of as a super common name. That name, which for so many people throughout history had been unspeakable, and the person behind the name unknowable, God comes to earth to get personal and says, yeah, call me Joshua. I want to know your name, and I want you to know mine. In our scripture uh, story, Jesus, in terms of his path, is on his way to what we, we know as Palm Sunday, to his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which then kicks off Holy Week, which sounds glorious until you know that Holy Week is full of suffering and agony for Jesus. And it's on this way to this sort of cosmic work that Jesus is going to. And, and like I know times when I'm particularly nervous or I know something difficult lies ahead, or I've got to be really focused, like I can develop a little bit of tunnel vision. I might wave, I might say, hey, but don't mess with me. I got, I got stuff on my mind. And Jesus very easily could have been that way as he's on his way to Jerusalem for this, the final week before his crucifixion. And still, on this journey to the cross, he comes, he comes along the path of Zacchaeus, and he's got interest in him. He's got time for him. He's got thoughts for him. Zacchaeus needs him. And Jesus is available for Zacchaeus. We, we read about Zacchaeus that he has this choice position, at least in terms of the world and the Roman structure of things. Zacchaeus has got a great gig. And he's super rich. And he has exploited that job that he has had to get every kind of bit of, uh, of wealth that he can. But we find pretty quickly that on that journey to being successful, he's lost a lot. And Jesus wants to reach into that loss. There's three primary things that we see that Zacchaeus has lost. First, Zacchaeus has lost his identity. Jesus calls out to him in the tree, Zacchaeus, which uh, that's quite a twist, right? Zacchaeus has climbed up the tree because he wants to see Jesus. He knows Jesus by name, but it's Jesus who is seeking out Zacchaeus and knows his name. So he says, Zacchaeus. Now, if, if you knew your uh, Hebrew name etymology, which folks back in this time would have known right, right away what Zacchaeus' name meant, they would have scoffed when they, whenever they heard the name Zacchaeus applied to Zacchaeus, because what it means is innocent. It means pure. And so Jesus cries out to him, you whose parents named you pure, clean, innocent. And, and Zacchaeus is anything but those things. He's lost those dreams that his parents had for him. He's lost that identity that was within his name. Jesus calls out to him by that name, by his intended identity. And later on, he calls him a child of Abraham in our text, which is one way to referring of sort of the bloodline lineage of the people of Israel. But the way that Jesus uses it here and the way that it is frequently used by Jesus and, and at times the scriptures is, is as a phrase to refer to a, any person, regardless of bloodline, being a child of God. In, in our story, 
Jesus says, hey, I'm going to go have dinner with you, Zacchaeus, and everybody gets mad at Jesus. My goodness, you sure picked the worst of the lot to have dinner with on your, on your passage through Jericho, didn't you? And Jesus says to those people, he too is a son of Abraham. And I, the son of man, the son of humanity, I have come to seek out and to save the lost. I've come to restore his identity and yours. The second thing that Zacchaeus has lost is his sense of belonging. He is hated with good reason by his community. He has to live among them. His work is to collect their taxes. But again, he's not been collecting taxes simply for the sake of a better community, that it's the pooling and sharing of our resources that provides for, for things. And in, in this time, in the way in which Zacchaeus carried out his job, it was, it was a very arbitrary decision daily on his point, what he would take from people. And it wasn't to make their lives or the community better. It was for his own hoarding of wealth. And so he was hated because of this. When we read about Zacchaeus being up in the tree, it's not just because he's a wee little man. And even that is in debate. When, when it gives us this description of him being what is translated sometimes as short in stature, it could mean that he's short and he can't see over everyone's head. But another dynamic going on is that nobody wants to be hip to hip in fellowship with Zacchaeus. And if Zacchaeus is in this crowd, there's no way that the people are going to make a space and say, hey, Zacchaeus, come on up here where you can have a good view. Now, Zacchaeus is much more likely to catch a bunch of elbows. Oh, Zacchaeus is over here. Well, here's my one shot. He'll never know where it came from. He's, he's lost any sense of belonging and being wanted by the people who surround him. And in the midst of that, Jesus is the one who says to him, Come down from that tree, let's spend some time together, me and you. The third thing I want to lift up, and I think these are the three primary things that Zacchaeus has lost. The final one is his purpose. Jesus sees him different than the crowd sees him. And I think Jesus sees Zacchaeus even differently than Zacchaeus has come to see himself. Jesus sees, again, those dreams that that God had for Zacchaeus when he was born, that I believe Zacchaeus' parents had for him, that there would be so much purpose that would be in this one human being that went way beyond grow old, get rich, and be alienated from everybody. There's so much more fulfillment for you in life than what you have right now, Zacchaeus, than to be lonely, to, to gain the world, and to lose your soul. So this story of Jesus and Zacchaeus, and we're going to keep peeling back the layers over the coming weeks, it truly is good news for Zacchaeus. It's good news for anybody who ever wondered, does God really know my name? Is there anybody on this, on this earth who really cares that I'm here? This story affirms, yeah, God does know who you are. God cares, and the way that God has so formed the church the people who follow God, they care as well. It's a narrative of promise for the world, for the people of the world, that the Savior of the universe is willing to sully his reputation to get to know even me and to get to know even you. That Jesus is personally invested in the wayward, the ostracized, the hungry, the oppressed, whoever it is that they themselves have made themselves kind of feel this way, or others have put it on them, that they don't matter, that there's no place for them. Jesus says, oh, there's a place for you. There is a good place for you, and there is a good path for you as well, no matter the mistakes along the way that have been made by you and to you. And it all starts in this story with the calling out of a name. Zacchaeus, come down from that tree, spend some time with me. The owner of the most wonderful name there is thinks your name is pretty wonderful. Thinks you are worthwhile. Uh, to close the sermon, I, I want to offer one other little facet to consider this, this Bible. Again, we'll do this over these four weeks. And it's not just that this story is reflective of how God sees us but it truly is reflective of the call that we have to see each other. 
And, and the first thing that I want to lift up is that, uh, at least this week, and then more things coming, but that everybody in this life deserves to have somebody look at them and talk to them the way Jesus talked to Zacchaeus. I mean, that, that is a life-changing, transformative experience that a person can have. And it would be shocking, I think, if we knew how many people on a daily basis did not have an encounter with another human like that and, and, and have not for a long time. Somebody who looks at them and talks to them the way that Jesus did. We remember as the church that we're not only the hands and feet of Jesus, but we're also the caring eyes. We are the extended hand of Jesus. We are the personal deep level connectors of Jesus for the people starting in our home and then in our neighborhood and in our community and in our nation and in our world. We are tempted, and I shared with you that I extroverted more in a half hour before church than I might for a whole week. Otherwise, because I'm I'm naturally somebody who inclines a little bit inward and like the expenditure of energy. It's something I got to psych myself up for with other people. It's very easy for me, and maybe for a bunch of us, whether you're introverted or not, to sort of to be tempted to keep things on surface level with others. But the, the way that Jesus interacts with us and calls us to live is to always be seeking deeper relationship with God and with each other. Jesus is always going deeper with us. Think about these differences as we close between surface level and personal, deeper level connecting. Surface level is fast. Going deeper takes time. Surface level is safe. Going deeper is risky. Surface level is certain. I say to you, how about this weather? Knowing what you're going to answer, oh, this hot weather, my goodness. Whew, safe interaction. To go deeper is to move into risky conversation. To stay at the surface is to be dismissive. To move deeper is to be interested. To stay on the surface, and oh, this is one that's tough for us in the church, it is to stay connected with those with whom we are familiar. Some of us have this experience and these habits brought on by years and even decades of, when I go to church, I say hi to the same five people. Everyone else... I hope you find somebody else that says hi to you. <laughs> but I got my friends and I'm here for them. But when we start getting personal with God and personal with each other, we start moving into saying hi to people in unpredictable relationships. And again, I get the expenditure here. It is still something I got to psych myself up for every time I'm with somebody I don't know to go, hi, I'm Michael. Have we met before? Because there's still this part of me in my lizard part of my brain that is like, this person is going to look at you and say, now why would I want to say hello to you? But then 99 times out of 100, people are friendly and they go, well, hi, I'm so-and-so, nice to meet you. And I always find that the risk is worth the reward. It's worth straying out from the familiar into the unpredictable. And then finally, staying at surface level and I'm thinking about this in terms of whether it be within the church or philanthropy beyond the church, staying at surface level, we can do that and help meet needs by giving money. When we, when we stay at surface level and we want to help, we, it costs us money. But when we move deeper and we want to help, it costs us ourselves. It costs me, not just money. To go into the deep end and get out of the shallow end, it takes courage, it takes practice, it takes a willingness to risk, but it is all worth it. That personal place where our true identity, our true belonging, and our true purpose is found. So I'm really looking forward to these coming sermons. We're going to have a good time together looking at how this plays out for Zacchaeus more deeply, and again, thinking about for us how it does as well. Let's pray together. Lord, we praise you. And in our praising of you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we ask that you would continue to open our eyes, that we would see you, that we would see each other, that, we would, that you would open our ears, that we would hear you, and that we would hear the voices of those around us. And then, Lord, we ask that you open our mouths so that to you and to others we would bear witness 
as the hymn says, that we would bear that warm truth that you have offered us everywhere to everyone. Lord, thank you for getting personal with us, not not being content with keeping us at arm's length. May we receive that invitation. May we know that embrace. And Lord, may it be something we replicate in our homes, in our communities, in this world. We pray this in the powerful and the personal name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.